Let's now look at the catabolic pathway for histidine. So I have histidine that's drawn here on the right on the left side of the screen, and histidine is initially going to get catabolized by an enzyme that exists both in the liver and the epidermis, and it's called histidine ammoniolase. And you will see in a few minutes why I mentioned that it's expressed in the epidermis. And to understand this enzyme, let's first look at histidine structure. Number one, we have to note the R group of histidine. And note that the R group is this imidazole ring. And one thing about the imidazole ring that's different from other aromatic rings is that it really is not that difficult to cleave apart this aromatic ring. It's not going to be near as difficult as it was with the tyrosine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan rings. Okay, Recall that those uh, rings require dioxygenases in order to open. This ring is not going to take anywhere near that kind of energy that we got from the uh, reactiveness of oxygen to open up the ring. It's a lot easier to do it here. In fact, to open up the ring, it only requires three enzymes. Okay, and the committed step is catalyzed by histidine ammoniolase. And in the process, what we're going to do is we're going to cleave off ammonia, and specifically the ammonia is, of course, going to come from the alpha amine. So that's the ammonia that's going to be lost by this enzyme. And if you need to see the mechanism of this enzyme, Enzyme, we have that in a video and it's actually a it's an actual it's actually a very interesting mechanism because it's going to use a special coenzyme called a methylidine imidazolone cofactor and the methylidine imidazolone is actually a post translational modification of this enzyme and so that means that, of course, it has to be regenerated after the cycle of this enzyme, and it is. But the methylidine imidazolone cofactor is actually just a post-translational modification of histidine ammoniolase, and it's required for the catalysis. And it's also worth mentioning that although we know about this enzyme and its activity, the human histidine ammoniolase has not been um, not been um, extracted or purified. So this is still something that's an active area of research, but we do know that it exists. And it's going to cleave off ammonia and give us something called urocanate. Now the reason I said that this is expressed in the epidermis is because urocanate actually plays an important role. Notice that with urocanate, it has a whole bunch of conjugated double bonds, right? It has this aromatic imidazole ring, right? But it also has this trans double bond right here. Right? And so the conjugation of the double bond is, su is such that it can absorb light in the ultraviolet range. And so part of the reason why the skin expresses this enzyme is because the light can be absorbed by urocanate. Of course, it destroys urocanate in the process, but it protects the uh, underlying tissue from damage from ultraviolet light. So the skin doesn't actually express the remaining enzymes in the catabolic pathway, but it does express this enzyme for the purpose of producing urocanate so that you can protect the underlying tissue and DNA from ultraviolet light damage. So that's an important consideration that we have to take. But urocanate, anyway, is going to be consumed by urocanate hydratase. Now, this enzyme effectively is going to be an addition reaction to an alkene, and specifically, it's going to be a hydration of an alkene. Now, notice right here I said that it's an NAD-dependent enzyme. Uh, we also have a mechanism uh, video, a, a video with the mechanism of this enzyme. And what I want to mention is that even though it's NAD-dependent, uh, we're not going to get a net NADH out of it. In fact, nowhere in the mechanism are we going to get an NADH. So we're just going to use NAD in the mechanism and then regenerate the resting state of NAD. Okay, So it's utilized to synthesize this molecule right here, but it, we're not going to get a net NADH. Okay? And again, this reaction is catalyzed by urocanate hydratase, and we have a video on the mechanism. Now, we're going to get something initially from the enzyme called the enol imidazolone propionate. And the enol imidazolone propionate is the thing that's shown right here. The enol imidazolone propionate, but it's quickly going to tautomerize and spontaneously. And it's pretty handy that it tautomerizes because we're going to have a serine hydrolase activity that's going to cleave open the ring. And the serine hydrolase is imidazolone propionase. It's imidazolone propionase, and it's a serine hydrolase that's specifically going to target this carbon right here for nucleophilic attack. And it's going to do the nucleophilic acyl substitution on that carbon. So 
One of the handy things about having the enol imidazole and propionate tautomerize into the, into the carbonyl version is because, remember, with enols, you can't do a nucleophilic acyl substitution on those. It's impossible. Um, you, it requires a carbonyl in order to do a nucleophilic acyl substitution. So it's pretty handy that the equilibrium favors the carbonyl version of imidazole and propionate. And then imidazolone propionase is going to catalyze the uh, cleavage of the ring or the imidazole-like ring using water. And it's going to give something called formaminoglutamate. And the reason it's called formaminoglutamate is because right here we have a formamino group, group. And you can clearly see that the rest of the molecule is just glutamate. Right? The rest of this is just glutamate, so we call it formaminoglutamate. And to be absolutely specific, we can say N-formaminoglutamate, okay? And the rest of the catabolism of uh, this is really going to be an exercise in tetrahydrofolate metabolism, okay? So um, I would recommend that you go watch the video on tetrahydrofolate metabolism, and really it's a biosynthetic uh, reaction scheme. But N-formaminoglutamate is going to react with glutamate formaminotransferase. And notice here, we're putting in a tetrahydrofolate. Okay, we're putting in a tetrahydrofolate, and what's going to happen is the formamino group on formaminoglutamate is going to get transferred onto the tetrahydrofolate. And so if we were going to look at the tetrahydrofolial group, the tetrahydrofolial group is just all this business right here. This is the tetra... oops. Well, you get the point. That's the tetrahydrofolial group. Of course, it includes that hydrogen. And the thing I circled in orange, that's the formamino group. And so the formamino group just gets attached to this uh, nitrogen right here. Okay. And so what that generates is formamino tetrahydrofolate. And that gets shunted into tetrahydrofolate uh, metabolism. Specifically, you'll have to look at the tetrahydrofolate biosynthesis uh, reaction scheme video. And certainly, I would recommend doing that. Now, of course, we're going to get glutamate in the process. Okay, so we get glutamate. Now the glutamate that we get is going to get um, degraded into alpha-ketoglutarate, and it's going to get degraded by glutamate dehydrogenase. So this is glutamate, glutamate dehydrogenase. And if you remember the reaction of glutamate dehydrogenase, recall that it required either NAD or NADP, right? It performed the dehydrogenation to generate a shift base, right? And then there's a subsequent hydrolysis that yielded, right? It, it cleaved off ammonia, right? It cleaved off ammonia, but we also got alpha ketoglutarate. So that's our final product. Our final product of histidine catabolism is going to be alpha ketoglutarate. Okay, and of course the alpha ketoglutarate is going to get shunted into the TCA cycle where it will ultimately form oxaloacetate, right? And then that will get shunted into gluconeogenesis. So we can ultimately say the alpha ketoglutarate will get shunted into the TCA cycle, right? Where it will form oxaloacetate and then that will get shunted into gluconeogenesis to form glucose. So we would say that histidine is a glucogenic amino acid. It's, gl it's glucogenic, right? And it's glucogenic because it can get ultimately degraded into, uh, it can get degraded into um, products that can be shunted into oxaloacetate synthesis, which can then get shunted into gluconeogenesis to form glucose. That's why it's glucogenic. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on histidine catabolism. Um, go, certainly go back and watch the video on the mechanism of urocanate hydratase and histidine ammonia lyase. But the really interesting biosynthesis, and we found that the imidazole ring really isn't as stable as the phenol, the benzene, and the indole ring. See you soon.